Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming out tonight for the panel discussion on Islamophobia and the surveillance of the Muslim communities. Um, I'm Vanessa. I'm an organizer with Orange Inc. And together with the International Socialist Organization, in conjunction with the Justice for Ayub efforts, we put together a panel discussion. We have three incredible speakers. Sophia Arias has come down from Boston, is an ISO member. Zaid, who is from the <coughs> uh, Mosque Al Tahid in Springfield um, and is part of a uh, community, Ayub's community. And Lynn Jackson from Project Salam in upstate New York. Um, so each person is going to speak for about 15 minutes and we're going to have a longer discussion. So this can be really interactive. We can share thoughts, questions. Um, I'm going to ask, does anyone have a problem um, being recorded? We're hoping to record a lot of this and get it out online. No problem? It's okay if you have an issue. Yeah, if anyone's uncomfortable, we can not record the audience. So we're going to probably going to record questions, if that's all right. Okay. Great. Um, we're also hoping that later tonight Ayub's lawyer will come and be able to share a few updates from the case. If not, several of the organizers with Justice for Ayub are here um, and are going to be happy to speak a little bit about that, I hope. So just again, thanks everyone for coming. And maybe we'll start off with And thanks for having me. I just wanted to sort of um, pause for a minute and ha take a minute to sort of pay my respects to Nelson Mandela, who just passed away today, a legendary anti-apartheid fighter, um, and who was also just recently removed from the U.S. Um, terrorist list mm -hmm. just a couple of years ago, uh, which really speaks to, I think, um, what, this, what, the, what the United States actually call, who they call a terrorist. Um, and yeah, so I will sort of take a broader um, step back on the question of um, Islamophobia and, and how we can fight it. Um, the other speakers, I'm sure, can speak to um, a, a youth's case more, uh, more specifically and the struggle around that. Um, I wanted to start first with some statistics that came out um, this year in a new report released by the Council of American Islamic Relations um, <coughs> titled Legislating Fear, Islamophobia and Its Impact in the United States. Um, and it talks about how actually uh, within uh, uh, the political spectrum, how uh, there's actually um, uh, the sentiment around uh, Muslims and Islamophobia uh, has actually shifted um, uh, around uh, to, to the right more um, among liberal, uh, um, liberal citizens. Um, after bin Laden's death, more Americans agreed that Muslims living in the United States increased the likelihood of terrorist attack, um, 27 versus 34 uh, percent previously and that they make America a more dangerous place to live um, at 25% from 17. And, and this is liberals, uh, people who identify as liberals. Um, at the same time, fewer respondents agree that Muslims living in the United States are supportive of the United States. That's 62% versus 52 previously, after the killing of bin Laden, which, by the way, um, happened um, under Obama's presidency. These shifts were all among liberals and moderates. The percentage of liberal respondents who agreed that Muslims in the US increased the likelihood of terrorist attack and make America more a dangerous place to live uh, shifted from 22 to 33 and from 8 to 24, respectively. In contrast, the percentage of conservative respondents who agreed that Muslims in the US increased the likelihood of terrorist attack and make America a more dangerous place to live did not significantly change after the killing, 38 for, uh, pre and 36 post. Um, respectively. Um, and I think this really speaks to the fact that um, while there was a new president, while Obama, um, for so some people, represented a, sh a different shift, actually, uh, that was at face value, I think, purely um, rhetorical in, in, in some respects. Um, another uh, study by the Public Religion Research Institute cited that 30% of the American public believe American Muslims want to establish Sharia law in the United States. Um, and that Islamophobic rhetoric remains socially acceptable. In uh, an, another research released in 2011, citizens are quite comfortable to not only oppose extending citizenship to legal Muslim immigrants, but also being public about that fact. Um, so these are actually, yeah, these are the implications and impact of a decade of scapegoating Muslims uh, uh, since 9-11. Um, and I think it actually does it represent a shift around uh, the fact that Islamophobia has not been challenged uh, in any way, sort of shape and form, uh, that, that's, that's effective, uh, even though there was a movement ar against the war in Iraq. Uh, um, the, the, the presidency of Obama promised uh, for a lot of uh, uh, voters a shift from the, the, the Bush era. So 
Um, people wanted an end to the war in Iraq. People wanted a defense of civil liberties. Um, people wanted, you know, better relations for Muslims uh, in the Middle East. And certainly, in, in many of his speeches, uh, 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 that was uh, sort of the rhetoric around the axis of evil, the rhetoric around the war on terror was abandoned, uh, but the policies remained, um, I think, and that's where you sort of see this, uh, 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 the, these, these statistics really hold. Um, and so this is important because these are the ideas that we, uh, that, that, that Americans are, are, are constantly bombarded with, obviously. So these are the ideas that Muslims are faced with when they're prosecuted by the media, when they're prosecuted in the courtroom. Uh, these are the ideas that, that, that uh, uh, you know, for, for many of the people on, 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 on that, that, that display, um, this is what the juries uh, are, are faced with when, you know, on the first day of the trial or even before then, uh, uh, when the media has, 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 has um, manufactured the case against Muslims who are accused of, 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 of terrorism charges. Um, um, the, bear in mind those statistics. Uh, and um, Right, so, um, so I'm going to sort of take a step back and, and look through other statistics around um, the, the impact or, or whatever, of, or, or the dangers around um, Islamic terrorism. So, threat, so study after study shows that you're more likely to die in a lightning strike or a car crash or from lack of health insurance in this country than you are of dying in a terrorist attack. You're more likely eight times, in fact, to be killed by an American cop um, or a toddler who, who, who uh, is, is in possession of a gun than you are to be killed by Islamic terrorists. Uh, in a 10-year period, 11 people were charged in the terrorism charges between 2001 and 2011 with killing 33 people are about the same number of people killed by three white males last year uh, uh, in a movie theater, in a uh, uh, elementary school in, in a suburb in Connecticut, and in a Sikh temple in Wisconsin. Uh, and, and the number of hate groups in the far right, um, according to the Southern Poverty Law Center, have um, jumped from uh, 149 organizations in 2008 to 1,007 in 2012. Of course, at the same time, 50% of all American Muslims have been visited by the FBI at least once since 9-11. Um, and thousands of Muslims have been surveilled, interrogated, um, charged, uh, uh, and, and imprisoned um, for, um, for uh, largely, yeah, predominantly manufactured plots um, by the FBI. <coughs> And bear in mind, obviously, we don't um, uh, we don't actually have any sort of studies. Largely, our, our law enforcement or homeland security um, bases much of 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 of, of or manufactures the sort of the spectacle of 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 the Muslim terrorist uh, with theories around radicalization that never actually uh, come up when we do talk about the kind of violence. Um, uh, that, that we have seen around mass shootings uh, that, 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 that predominate um, largely by white males. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, the ideology of, of, of uh, Islamophobia right now has actually produced an entire um, industry that, that fosters Islamophobia, creates a climate for hate crimes, support for wars abroad are absolutely critical to that, uh, uh, and the intellectual and legal support for um, certifying anti-Muslim laws. Um, 78 bills. Um, have um, d been designed to sort of to, to uh, who, th that are against Sharia law uh, uh, um, and sort of this sort of uh, we want American laws for Americans ha has has come up and you have in 24 states these laws have been introduced and seven states have passed these laws um, and of course Islamophobia is the bigoted ideology that attributes to Islam a uniquely authoritarian violent anti-democratic misogynistic uh, uh, characteristics that sees it as a static uh, 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 religion that has a sort of a, um, that needs to be civilized. Obviously, this predates 9/11. This is part of uh, 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 the, the the ideology of Orientalism uh, that that you know um, that had to be produced by you know European colonial uh, conquest uh, in the Middle East and in North Africa um, that attributes to, to to Muslim sort of savage characteristics that the white man needs to save. Um, you know, brown women from brown men. You you have all these characteristics, and that largely um, that th this is the ideology that predates 9/11, but was incredibly important to rehabilitate after um, after that. Um, let's see. So it is a form of racism that is distinguished from others uh, in many respects because both of its proponents, liberals and conservative, don't justify it as um, you know this is a necessary infringement of human rights. 
but exactly because they say we actually are, are speaking in the name of human rights and, and equal rights when we are um, attacking Muslims. So you have uh, uh, ideas about, you know, Iraq needs to be bombed so we can give them democracy. Um, you know, Afghanistan needs to be bombed because we need to save their women. And of course, last year uh, when NATO um, uh, 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 met in Chicago, you had these billboards um, that were paid for by Amnesty International and buses. Um, that basically uh, congratulated uh, NATO and told them not to leave Afghanistan uh, so they can save, you know, w in the name of women's rights. Uh, and so um, Islamophobia in the Obama era obviously looks a little bit different than the you're either with us or you're against us. Um, uh, in, in this sort of new climate, there is an, this sort of this dichotomy between good Muslims who, um, you know, cooperate with us, uh, dialogue with us, who are willing and able to um, help um, uh, law enforcement, um, you know, sit in, in, in dialogue with them, but also uh, can support um, uh, U.S. Um, uh, wars abroad uh, and, and root out the extremists in our communities. That's sort of the role in, 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 in um, much of um, uh, the, the, you know, the, the new sort of era of, of Muslim uh, relations with the Obama administration has been. Um, and then, of course, you have the bad Muslims who don't comply. You know the Ayubs, the Tariq Mahanas, the, you know, and, and and so on, who refuse to be FBI informants, who refuse to go into their mosques and 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 snitch on other on other uh, 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 um, um, members of, of the congregation, and so those are um, um, those are obviously the bad Muslims, uh, and so they have to pay, um, and so uh, of course Islam is always on trial, regardless of the rhetoric that's put forward, and so you obviously you know from from the beginning, from the outset, you had. Uh, much of um, there's both the sort of outward attack on you know women wearing hijab, um, uh, you know firebombing of mosques um, and so on. So those are sort of the more outward uh, uh, attacks, and then there are of course the more insidious ones that are that are that are brought in um, when um, uh, the state actually has a case against um, uh, uh, Muslims. So for example, the Holy Land Foundation is one of the most uh, famous uh, Islamic charity groups. Um, that was shut down by executive order after 9-11, and its members were charged with material support for terrorism for giving aid uh, uh, um, uh, to um, uh, Palestinians in Gaza. Um, and, and basically what they said was, you're giving aid to Hamas. Um, when in fact, well, <coughs> they're in sanctions, this is an elected government, um, and, and, and actually um, they're in sanctions for a reason because the United States has been complicit in allowing um, uh, Israel to, to uh, put them under siege. So uh, that's sort of the more um, uh, uh, clearer examples. Um, but that, that charity actually, that in basically impugned that all Muslims who exercise one of their basic uh, tenets of Islam, which is to give to charity, now have to be on watch because their accounts, their assets will be frozen. They will be charged uh, with material support for terrorism, and, 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 and which has become this incredibly um, you know, amorphous uh, charge that's thrown out at anything. So, you know, the cases of like Fahad Hashmi, for example, uh, providing material support for terrorism uh, constituted um, le allowing an acquaintance to, to come to his apartment um, because supposedly the acquaintance had waterproof socks that were going to go to Al Qaeda. So, this sort of absurd mm -hmm. uh, 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 idea that anything, anything constitutes material support for terrorism. Um, similarly, I think you, you clearly saw. Um, during the Boston uh, Marathon bombing, um, the elder brother, uh, Tamerlan Sarnayev, um, the media did not focus on the fact that he was largely an avid reader of um, uh, extremist, anti-government, far-right literature, conspiracy theory, uh, in a lot of ways, uh, which has largely been the fodder of a lot of attacks. You think of sort of the LAX shooter recently. Uh, uh, at the airport in Los Angeles and so on, largely uh, 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 you know, influenced by the far right. That was not uh, the, the main thing that the media parroted on and on. It was the fact that they said he started praying five times a day. Uh, and so any attempt to practice your religion is immediately, according to radicalization theories of the FBI and Homeland Security, is a trigger to say that you are um, applauding um, um, a terrorist attack on the United States. Um, <laughs> Awesome. Um, right, and this is obviously um, <clears throat> how do we fight this? I'm just going to sort of go right in. Um, and I think this is where the struggle to free Ayub is really, I think, um, quite rare and really important to actually have. Um, organizing, you know, around the case of Tariq Mahana, 
uh, who was another, uh, uh, who was a, a pharmacist from a suburb in, 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 in Worcester, Massachusetts, refused to inform his, on his community, a significant community leader, um, uh, refused to plead guilty. They, they harassed him, uh, uh, arrested him twice, um, arrested him before he left the country because he could no longer, um, you know, live in these sort of conditions of being harassed all the time, and um, slapped him with all these charges, including translating a book from Arabic to, to English, um, exercising was another one. I remember on the first day of the trial, um, they just had, they just kept playing like reels of the 9-11 bombing and, oh. and Bin Laden. And that's sort of, you know, immediately the first thing that the jury sees um, that, that sort of sets that. And I think it's really important that, that Ayub has um, the kind of multiracial uh, broad uh, 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 struggle uh, around this, uh, the defense Muslims from state repression, because I actually think the fact that there isn't enough solidarity is the reason why uh, Muslims will plead guilty uh, mm -hmm. for lighter lighter sentences, which you know is ju just basically means not life, but what it actually means is like 15 years, uh, uh, basically half of your you know or whatever your life. Um, uh, it's because there's not enough solidarity to to actually be able to fight that, or um, uh, uh, you know a lack of solidarity. Solidarity means that the, the mosques feel that they need to be um, in a position where they um, are, are neutral. They don't say anything um, when, when they're informants uh, 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 in, their, in their congregation, or they actually um, co you know, cooperate with the FBI uh, because they fear that they're, they'll, they'll, um, they'll cause, you know, they'll <coughs> make it worse. And I think that's really critical to actually say that because we want a shift. Uh, it, the question of community support is really critical to shift things away from uh, solutions around the state. Um, as we clearly saw about around the Boston Marathon bombing, um, uh, 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 largely the city um, uh, accepted a complete lockdown of the city, complete mm -hmm. martial law, <coughs> unprecedented in any city in the country, um, was just civil liberties were just given away. Um, because of the, 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 the fear factor was so incredibly strong, there wasn't even a second thought um, that the city's under lockdown and there are tanks on our street. Um, so I think that's really important that we actually have that. Secondly, I think the Muslim community um, needs to cut against this, this dichotomy of good Muslims versus bad Muslims um, and soundly reject FBR surveillance and entrapment. Um, and I think demand that beyond rhetoric, we actually want uh, uh, real action. And I think you saw that especially around the NYPD surveillance when the Associated Press uh, uh, released a report that the NYPD uh, was was spying on uh, you know in Muslim restaurants and and, 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 and student groups and uh, mosques and and in, in New Jersey New York uh, you had an outcry and organizing that happened you had a number of uh, uh, Muslim leaders who boycotted uh, Mayor Bloomberg's um, New Year's uh, uh, breakfast they boycotted uh, this this Ramadan NYPD conference that came out um, there there was there, there was there was sort of a sense that we 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 refused to comply with this. Uh, and I think that that was incredibly important, uh, 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 and 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 uh, and actually forced uh, um, the uh, mayor elect to say he would do something about it. Although you know, it's 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 the FBI spies on on, on Muslims, so it's it's actually a question of um, of, of again a federal um, a federal policy of of organizing that needs to be national. Um, and I think that, but those are the sort of the first steps I think in terms of rejecting that. Um, most critically, I think we, we, we have to sort of invert this sort of common sense logic um, that Americans are safer and freer today because of the war on terror. Mm -hmm. This idea that, oh, maybe we don't have enough terrorist attacks or whatever because um, it's working, you know? And I think that that's, that's clearly, um, not only is it false and not only is it racist, but I think it actually prevents the majority of ordinary people, um, you know, the 99% to use Occupy's term, it actually prevents them from, from, from thinking through what, ac what does it actually mean for us um, and, and the fact that we are actually far less freer, uh, more of our rights have been <coughs> taken away uh, um, uh, as a result of the war on terror. Um, a country that's founded on slavery and genocide constantly has to build up a mythology of itself. Uh, as, as you know, in, in as a country that's you know um, equal and, and and so on, but I think especially given that Islam, you know, no Muslim country has ever invaded the United States. The kind of the kind of ideology that needs to be produced about uh, the dangers of Islam uh, 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 has to, is is just as strong because I think that the um, the conditions for you know the U.S. being able to hold over a thousand bases around the uh, around the world, military bases. Uh, be able to have strategic hold of, of uh, 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 you know, countries in the Middle East, 
in Central Asia, in Africa. Uh, I think that the, 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 there is there's obviously the sense that Islamophobia is really critical in terms of scapegoating, both domestically and to justify that, even though the Pentagon itself acknowledges to some degree that there's only a couple hundred um, uh, people uh, in Al-Qaeda itself. It's negligible. And yet this, this, this ideology continues to be produced. You know, the real issues, I think that there is, you know, there are actually material consequences to that, um, to, to, to convincing a majority of people that they don't need to care about um, scapegoating the Muslims. No one was ever hurt, no one was hurt, and there was no property damage, and yet they are serving these incredibly long sentences. And it's like, well, so what is, what is going on? And I'd like to talk about, just to give an example so you can understand, like, what the government does to Muslims. I'm going to talk about a case in Albany a little bit, and then I'm going to expand out a little bit about what, about what we think is going on with these particular cases where people, where the Muslims are self-targeted. Um, on August 4, 2004, two Muslim men in Albany, Yassin Araf and Mohammed Hussein, were arrested by the FBI. Their houses were raided in the middle of the night, and their wives and children were terrorized. This raid and arrest in Albany, did anyone hear about it? It's been a little while, it's been like 10 years. Okay. So, um, this was a huge story in Albany. Albany may be the capital of New York State, but it's a little tiny city. Um, and the raid was, it was huge. It was just huge. The FBI had a press conference. The governor came, the mayor came. It was a really big deal. deal. It was big news in Albany. Um, and what happened is that, so what, what happened in this case? So Yassin Aref, was the imam of the Masjid al Salam Mosque in Albany. And um, he and his wife were UN refugees from northern Iraq, and they came to Albany in 1999 from Syria. Yassin had actually survived Anfal, which was Saddam Hussein's systematic extermination of the Kurds. Mm. Um, Mohammed Hussein was a pizza shop owner. He'd lived in this country for 20 years. He was a very proud American. He was so happy to have his American citizenship. And he worked very hard, and he supported his wife and six children with a small pizza shop and renting apartments. Um, the Aref Hussein case was created by the FBI, because the, it's hard as an American sometimes to think the FBI does this, but mm. they actually create these cases. They, they create them. Mm. And so what they did, the FBI sent an informant in. The FBI was interested in Yassin Aref. That was the target. To them, Mohammed Hussein was uh, collateral damage. Um, and uh, so to, to make this involved plot, so they, the FBI created this plot. So they send in an informant named Shahid Hussein. So they send the informant in, and the informant uh, goes to Mohammed Hussein and says, oh, brother, you're so good in the religion. Teach me your religion. I want to learn your religion. Oh, you're such a good man. Let me loan you money. And Mohammed Hussein, who was a very proud man, said, I don't need your money. And Shahid said, oh, please, please, I'll loan you money. I'll loan you $50,000, and you only have to pay back $45,000. You know, please let me. So at any rate, this goes on for months. Like, I always thought if you had a sting operation, you know, the policeman stands on the corner, and, and they say, hey, you want to buy some dope? You know, and then you say yes, or you say no, and then you get arrested or not, right? That's a sting operation. Mm -hmm. But that's really not a sting operation, what the FBI does with these kinds of cases mm -hmm. is, it goes on for months and months and months and months and months. So finally, uh, Mohammed Hussein was, uh, had you know, financial challenges, and he accepted the loan from Mohammed. And, um, but of course, the FBI was after Yassin. They didn't care about Mohammed, and they wanted Yassin. So, but Yassin was the imam of the mosque, and what, one of the roles of an imam is to witness loans. And so, um, Shahid call, got Mohammed to say, let's get Yassin to witness the loan. So Yassin witnessed the loan. And for that, those two men got 15 years in prison. Well, 15 years in prison for doing, mm -hmm. for doing that. Mm -hmm. For taking a loan, witnessing a loan. Can you imagine? Can you imagine our government, what it would like to be an immigrant to this country, to come to this country because you believe in the American ideals and the government tricks you like this? It's absolutely disgusting. Mm -hmm. Any rate. All of these cases have endless details. You know, like, uh, a lot of, I know many people here are for, uh, were interested in working on Ayub's cage, which is wonderful. And uh, there's all these myriad details of the cases. All these cases have all these details. But in Yassin's case, it just boils down to Yassin witnessed a loan, Muhammad took a loan. And for that, they got 15 years in prison. 
Um, so what, what exactly is going on here? And I always think the most telling part of this case is when the FBI had a post-sentencing press conference. And that's where the FBI gets to crow about their win. So they get to, you know, they have to crow about it. And so one of the reporters asked if the government believed that Yassin Aref was actually a terrorist. And this is what the prosecutor in the case said. And I quote, because I got the videotape. So this is a quote. Did he actually himself engage in terrorist acts? We, we didn't have the evidence of that, but he had the ideology. Mm. Our investigation was concerned with what he was going to do here, and in order to preempt anything else, mm. we decided to take the steps that we did. And so, that really begs the question, was Yassina Ref targeted for what he did or what the government thought he might do? And um, ultimately, obviously, he was prosecuted for what the government thought his thoughts were. Because, of course, we can never know the thoughts of somebody else. Mm -hmm. But it is absolutely ridiculous. At any rate, ultimately, Yassin and Muhammad were sent away to prison. Yassin was sent to a special Muslim prison. Has anyone heard about our special Muslim prisons that we have in the Midwest? <laughs> They're called communications management units. Anyone hear of them? No? Okay. Communications management units are specific, are very restrictive prisons. They were so restrictive that um, where Yassin was, he was not allowed to have contact visits with his family. So if his wife and children came to visit him, he could only look th at them through glass and talk to them on a phone as opposed to sit next to his wife and hold his baby. Um, he was kept, uh, there was two prisons, one's in Terre Haute, Indiana, one's in Marion, Illinois, and uh, he uh, ultimately spent two years in one and two years in another. Um, fortunately, Yassin uh, did a lawsuit. He's currently involved in a lawsuit because we believe these communication management units are illegal. Um, so what happened in Yassin's case is I think the community was shocked. There, so this is why I'm so excited about Ayub's case because he hasn't gone to trial yet, and there's a lot of people sitting in this room, and it's wonderful. In Yassin and Muhammad's case, the peace community were, was a little slow to wake up. And it was only when they were convicted that two women got together and said, oh my goodness, there are ten children involved in this case. Yassin has four, Muhammad has six. And that these children needed school supplies, and actually that is why the Muslim Solidarity Committee formed to support Yassin and Muhammad. And we still raise money, we still support their families, we still... Um, write grants for them, those kinds of things. And so the FBI says, hi, I'm from the FBI. And then you should say, well, I can't trust you because you lie. Call my lawyer and goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> Why can't I come inside? Call my lawyer and goodbye. Have you something to hide? Call my lawyer and goodbye. But where is your patriotic pride? I have the Bill of Rights on my side. Call my lawyer and goodbye. Distinguished guests moderators, supporters of IU, supporters of the human family. I'm very touched by the audience here tonight because some of the audience come from the very region that IU lives. Maybe about one, two, three, four, five that I see. How many of you knew IU by a show of hands? One, two. And how many is here to support IU by a show of hands? Okay, you see this? So this shows us something. And before I get into what I'm going to say, I'm going to make a little precondition to this. I'm going to tell you a little story. Well, matter of fact, an observation. I'm not much into raising animals, dogs, for any animal lovers. It's not a spite against the animal lovers. <laughs> but I've learned there are two types of dogs in America when you're happy. You have the domesticated dog, where the master loves that dog. He'll groom him, he'll clean him, he'll feed him, he'll teach him tricks. He's happy. He'll even teach him how to protect the master. The second one is what I call the rogue dog. That's the one who has no master. The only thing that's a master is himself. He's the dog that might end up being in your trash one day and you call the vets to come get him to put him down, put him to sleep. He's the dog that might bite you because he doesn't fear you. The reason why I'm giving you that analogy is because if you understand what is going on when you talk about Islamic phobia, you first have to understand what is fear. I remember there was an old uh, acronym that went, fear is what, a false, false evidence appearing real. 
I think it was philosophers, contemporary uh, philosophers, Parker and Moore, who said it's a fallacy. A fallacy is basically what? An argument or something put forth with no proof, no grounds, no evidence. I listened to both of them, and, and I like what they had to say, but I'm going to put a little different twist on it. Ayub is just a poster, man, I won't say child, of what really goes on here in America. Mm -hmm. Ayub happens to be one black, poor, and Muslim. Mm -hmm. We're the only people here in America, 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment that are created to be considered human beings. Now, with a Muslim, what? You're a Muslim? Oh, what's that make me now? You know, until, in order to understand a problem, you have to go back to the context. You have to go to the historical aspect of it, you have to go to the relevant aspect of it, and you have to go to the scriptural aspect of it. She told you something that many of you might not have understood the terminology, Sharia law. Well, there's two things you gotta understand about Sharia law that a lot of people have to fear about the Sharia law. First, you have to understand what is a jihad, a jihad, which comes from the word jihadah, which means one who struggles, one who struggles for their dignity, one who struggles to protect themselves, their land, their honor, their religion, their family. I think all human beings can do that, right? Right? We have a right to that, don't we? Okay. So we're on the same page. I like that. And the same line. Now, if you understand the Sharia, that just supports it, meaning it keeps it in its correct performance. When people say, what is a fundamental, uh, fundamental is, uh, Islamic extremist? I don't even look at them. Because one thing, the Quran does not promote fundamentalists. The Quran does not promote extremists. The Quran promotes peace. But it also promotes the ideology and the understanding. If someone strikes you, you have the right to strike them back or give them mercy. Mercy doesn't mean that you punch me in the face, and so I forgive you. No, mercy meaning I'll give you that, but let's keep it in context. Let's come up with a solution so you don't do it again, because if you do it again, it's between me and you. Understand that? Mm -hmm. Now, when we talk about IU, you're just looking at the face. <laughs> it does not matter what race, creed, color, sexual orientation, or sexual preference, because we all have a right to what? Our dignity. Mm -hmm. But when you infringe upon our dignity, what we do, we start saying, well, you're infringing upon my human rights. Last time I checked, our human rights is a God-given right, right? Mm -hmm. So no law, percepts of law, or any type of any type of anything as we consider what we will say. The Constitution can give me that right. It can't give you that right. Now, I had a, a conversation earlier today before I did this, the speech. And I started to write something, but I said, no, I don't have to write something. Because being 50 years old, almost, I can tell you the experience of what it is to be a Muslim in this country, way before 9-11, okay? The thing is, before 9-11, truthfully, most of the inheritance over here in North America were people of color. This color. People didn't understand what the most, matter of fact, they would go back to Malcolm X mm -hmm. or the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Mm -hmm. That was the first recorded documented thing of a Muslim being recorded by the FBI. Okay? They don't tell you about that. So what happened is, what happened, excuse me, I'm gonna try a little water. Mm. What happened after that, the nation of Islam came on the scene with the Hephthalites. They were outside the mainstream religion of orthodoxism. And what was going on was a lot of people saying, well, this is a black religion. This is a religion that's trying to do something against white America. So they went through their trials and tribulations. As time went on, you had other people that came forth. H. Rap Brown. Any of you ever heard of H. Rap Brown? I'm surprised I don't see him up there. He's doing life. He fought for this country, telling them right where it's at. Matter of fact, what was the thing he once said? American is violence, what, apple pie? Mm -hmm. See, but they don't talk about him. What has happened, they have made the public think that the only Muslim is Pakistanian. Mm -hmm. That's what's going on, I'm being real. Because in order for me to be a Muslim, a law says you have to give the truth for the truth. I have to be objective, very objective. And this you have to be, because a lot of people say, well, 9-11, I like what she said about Iraq. Anybody ever heard of the Caspian Sea? Mm -hmm. Okay, you know what happened with the Caspian Sea, so those who don't know, I'll inform you. The reason why they went in and got Saddam is because the Caspian Sea happens to be a region near the sea where they had said 17 years prior to this invasion that it would help in the, how would you say, a better energy source for Western population, Western culture. That's what it was all about. See, they could have went in and got Saddam just like they got Noriega. They could have went in, well, got you. They got you. Now, 
bring this back to the context. You know, the real fear I think that's really going on from objective? See, some of the people in America look at Islam and say, well, wait a minute. When these brothers or sisters strap up a bomb, they're doing it for this or that. Yes, they're frustrated. The same way that you and I, if we're frustrated that we can't eat, we don't have housing, we will steal, we will sell drugs, we will rob, we will do anything, because what is the first law of, pres of, of human beings? Law of self-preservation. Mm -hmm. So we put a spin on it. Now, see where it really gets deep. It's only after 9-11 that people really started saying, well, who are these Muslims? And will they blow us up? Not a lot of Americans think like that. Because if they thought about that, thought it like that, you wouldn't have Islam here now. Let's be realistic. Would you? Do you really think so? Think about it for a minute. When somebody doesn't want something, they'll stop it. Matter of fact, you've had, if you go back into the history, when the first mosque was, what was it, 1930-something over in Worcester, I think it is. I can't remember the exact date. Worcester, one of the first ones, yes. Or Quincy, excuse me, Quincy Mass, I stand corrected. Here's my point. Be careful of your fallacies, your perceptions. Because sometimes, in helping the cause, you gotta understand that cause. You really have to understand that cause. When this young lady had asked me this question this afternoon, earlier in school, she said, are you gonna really be objective? I said, what do you mean? Are you really gonna tell them the fears of the people? I said, well, how can I tell them the fears of the people when I look at tell them the fears that I feel? She said, well, tell them. This is one of the fears that I have found out. You know who kills the most Muslims? Who? Oh, Muslims. Muslims. So they're thinking, well, wait a minute. If you can kill each other, what's going to stop you from killing us? See, when the Nation of Islam was over here, they weren't strapping up bombs and they weren't going down to the world trade and blowing it up. So they thought in their mind, they said, oh, okay, so it's a passive religion. Because the Nation of Islam was passive. Almost like that dog I told you. The one that you can train him, domesticate him, feed him. But when you really look at it, when you got someone who has nothing to fear but their Lord, and the only thing they ask is the respect that they give you, and when you violate that safety of respect, now you have a problem. See, if you give a person the respect of dignity, you won't have this problem. There wouldn't be a fear. Because fear is only one step away from trying to understand somebody. If you think about it, that's the only thing that blocks you from trying to understand somebody. Think about it. I mean, really truthfully think about it. <clears throat> Matter of fact, I can give you one more story. I love telling stories. You see, I love data. I love statistics. You see, we're, we're common people. It's good to know these numbers. They are more professionally inclined to give you these numbers. But I am more professionally inclined to give you my experience as a Muslim and black and poor in America. Now, there's a story about this bird. And this particular bird, he didn't want to go south with all the other birds. It was gross. It's your nature. Migrate. It's kind. He said, nah, I'm all right on this branch. There's plenty of food. I'll catch you. I'll catch up. So he said, all right, you'll be sorry. His bird, he's on this branch, and he's happy. He's got worms all of a sudden. He's got a branch all to himself. He couldn't get any better. The season started to change. The food started getting scarce. So he started going, woe is me, woe is me. How did I get in this predicament? So one night it got very cold. And his wings froze. It got stuck together. He fell off the branch. And when he fell onto the ground, he was able to, when he's frozen wings, get a little worm here, a little worm here. Almost like basically saying, I'll make do for the moment, even though I'm in a bad situation, but I'm gonna make do. So a cow comes along. And he messes over the bird. Now the bird's rolling around in his feces. He's warm. He's rolling around in this mess. But he's still getting a little warm in there. Eh, it's not so bad. I can wait till tomorrow to get up out of here. Well, tomorrow never came. A cat came from behind the tree, pulled him out of the mess, and ate him. You know what the moral of that story is? Everything or everyone in life that messes over you is not always your enemy. Everyone that pulls you out of mess is not always your friend. Perception. Perception, I say it again, perception. If you came here tonight for IU, you came for the wrong reason. But if you came here for a brother, a human being, of the extension of the human family, welcome aboard, family. Understand? 
Now, all those that's here for you, let me hear you say, I am. I am. But all those here for the human family, let me hear you say, I am. I, I am. am. Thank you. Talked to the attorney um, on our way back from doing a video shoot in downtown Springfield. Um, we were on location where Ayub was arrested um, and back in December 9th of 2011, around 7 p.m., he had closed down his shop, Nature's Garden, um, and was going to, there's a little uh, store in, in a gas station lot, and um, that's where the police stopped him and um, cuffed him and th did a thorough pat frisk and found nothing on him, <laughs> even though they were, he, um, they were instructed, the two officers, to uh, stop him and, and search for a gun. Um, they threw him in the back of the cruiser and um, proceeded to uh, conduct a more thorough uh, pat frisk and then a search in his underwear, um, allegedly revealed a gun. And um, so that's what he's facing charges on, an unlicensed firearm. 15 years he could be sentenced up to. And uh, the night that he was uh, arrested, he was not recorded, audio or visual, when they interviewed him, not in So um, we, we haven't gone to trial yet, so that, that will flush, get flushed out during trial. Um, and uh, they never um, did a fingerprint analysis before they sent it to the state crime lab to uh, do a a testing of the gun so they would fire it and everything. And um, they alleged, they said they ran a FID uh, check on, on Ayub to see if he was licensed to carry a firearm. And we learned um, at a hearing a couple of weeks ago that indeed that never took place. There's a report that was uh, provided through a Freedom of Information Act request that police never ran his name. Um, that evening and uh, so there are other other more concerning problems with his case this this fabricated um, case this manufactured case against him to force him to comply and um, Ayub has been harassed by the FBI and he's actually complained about it to um, Ben Swan the representative for um, the community his community and um, there was a phone call placed from that office to the FBI, and um, there was some voicemail or something. But you know, so that's going to get fleshed out too during the trial, which was <coughs> going to take place December 12th, but now um, it's been continued to February 18th. So hopefully, students will be back. Um, we'll have more time to organize with Springfield residents and get more support for Ayub and more awareness. And when we were on location yesterday, we got an opportunity to just meet folks from the street, hand out our literature to cars that were driving by, and um, people saw you know, our cameras, people saw our music. Thank you, Sheldon Gaynor, who um, his music. music is online and you can find more information on our Facebook page Justice for Ayub and also we have a website that's incredible um, done by a member of our team um, and everybody's you know pretty much doing this from our from the, the, the base of our heart you know and 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 that's the best way of, of meeting people um, that I feel and and I've made so many friends along the way, people I haven't met, um, you know, people that we've met along the way, but also new folks. So I'm really happy that there's a core group of people dedicated to um, visiting Ayub now and also um, just being there for him morally. Um, and also I see um, folks from the um, Hampshire College um, community, um, what is it, the C community, C community Partnerships, Partnerships for Social Change, for social change um, who brought in a lot of reinforcement for one of our court, the, the motion to suppress hearing, which was, which got denied, I learned this morning. So um, the judge denied it. Um, the 
decision is a 12 page decision which will be made available on our website um, when we get it um, it was getting proofread yes to, um, during the afternoon so when we get it we'll put it on our website so people can actually um, read why he ruled against it and it's it's going to involve a lot around um, the legality of Ayub's patent frisk and whether and when and where when he was arrested and at what point and so it's about that so it'll be very interesting to um, to follow um, on that respect alone um, so Ayub we visited him last night and um, I think he tried to call in um, and he was excited I think yesterday he thought it was yesterday the talk um, and so so I think he was trying to call in just to see, um, you know, just to get an update because he really he's inside now because the twenty-five thousand dollar cash bail is out of reach right now, and um, he really, really he's expressed, you know, how he how much he wants to be around the circle, around that table with us when we talk about the events where we're going to do, how we're going to organize to get him out. Um, and, and, and who else we need to reach out to and, and what other things we need to do, like this panel right here is fabulous. So um, David Woodson, thank you for your leadership in putting and pulling this together. Um, so that's my, my quick update, but um, we have an incredible, we have folks that are, you know, it's a collaborative effort, people who are doing our Facebook page, you know, and also our website is incredible, so get up to date with that. Um, on, with, with th using those tools and just be with us. So I hear, I see a lot of people here. So that might you is this. Even in America, well, I've only been in America, so I'll take that back. <laughs> <laughs> it hurts me to my heart that, given the amount that you said they could be raised for IU, Western, I don't want to put it out there, but there's a lot of money in the Pioneer Valley mm -hmm. with the Muslim community, mm -hmm. and they're doing nothing. Mm. Yet the ones that are from the poor communities of Islam is here tonight. Mm -hmm. See, so that's showing me something. I can walk by somebody who's not from this country and they won't even give me a salam. So you know what happens? The trickling down effect of the revolution? The people that's been living here say, well, if you don't consider us Muslims, you're not Muslims neither. Mm -hmm. There's an old saying, the doctor says, don't do this, don't do that. But the funny thing, sometimes the patients outlive the doctor. So when you irrigate yourself in a position and you say that you think you know what you believe in, and you tell people this is what you believe in, but at the same time you deny your brother and sister and what you believe in, opposition. There can never be a revolution till there is unity.